Okay, so we know what the best comps are on the 14.1 patch so far. The very fun and interactive pet to kill Kali Karthus. The very fair cat's power level of Disco. Or some of the rerolls that are terrorizing the ladder. But surely there are more comps, right? Well, in this video, we're going to cover all the A and B tier comps that actually can compete with the S tier comps as long as you know the right conditions. Let's go ahead and jump right into them. Before we start, I want to give a shout out to my sponsor, Mobilytics, who is helping bring you guys this video. Mobilytics is a dedicated data website to help you find the analysis and edge you need to climb. Check out their stuff at mobilytics.gg slash TFT, where you can find compositions by myself, Disop, and many other top players in North America. By downloading their overlay, you can get meta comps in game, as well as look at different community comps and my own compositions I'm using to climb. It's also the overlay that I use that recommends me real time data of augments, as well as other information happening in the lobby that I can stay up to date. Download the app so you can get your best set 9.5 comps in game with the Mobilitix overlay. Spellweavers are really powerful and because of its versatility, I'm putting it towards the top of A tier. The core of this comp is very simple. You're always gonna be trying to play around KDA super fans. You're always gonna play around Kennen, Lilia, Nico, and Echo. And then from Echo Spellweaver trait, you get an easy KDA tech either through Ari, Seraphine, and then you play around Annie slash uh, Lulu as potential ways to bolster your spell your ranks. If you play around Emo Annie, you want blue buff on this Annie, and then you want to go for four Emo because four Emo makes her mana break points to be able to do one auto fewer, and she's going to be spam casting. And if you're rolling for Seraphine, you can probably go for like Shojin or blue buff, uh, and you go for Nashers, and then use the super fan item to help bolster her damage. And that also applies to Lulu. Part of the reason why why uh, I'm kind of itemizing this way in the back is to showcase the different types of itemization that you can possibly do depending on if you get one or two tiers. If you're going for Annie, a lot of times you want to go for that blue buff for pretty much all the carries, but uh, Shoujin is often what you end up slamming a lot of times due to item economy. And Shoujin is totally fine as well because the tempo matters. If you're rolling for Annie, you want to roll at five. If you're rolling for Seraphine, you want to roll at six. And if you're rolling for Luli, you want to roll at seven because that's just usually how it goes for one cost, two cost, and three cost. Now, the thing about it that's really important is you do want a secondary carry as i noted you want to prioritize the first carry items you want to go like shoujin nashers on seraphine and then you want to start prioritizing things like tank items and shred and then you want to go for a secondary carry because in the late game you're going to struggle to just have one carry do it all and a lot of times you end up using ari as your secondary carry so you go for like whatever you can hit right if you can hit blue buff great but it's kind of hard to get two more tiers oftentimes throwing like a gunblade or like a jg or maybe like you know instead of if you're playing like a lulu second secondary you just like go for like a death cap instead there's a lot of different things you can do just make sure that you have some form of uh damage it is worth noting that sh straight up ap like death cap and archangels is worse on spell weavers because you get so much ap every time you cast but a lot of times you actually do want mana if you possibly can because those are really good and don't forget like things like red buff are also totally fine because you do want anti-heal and you do want mr shred in terms of what kind of shred you prefer i personally like spark a lot better than uh shiv because spark is a lot more about the immediate burst of your units and about your front line going from the back but if you're playing things like seraphine uh seraphine is actually good at jumping past the front line and hitting back line because they clump and you might notice that i actually put onto uh the chalkboard that says that seraphine 3 is actually the most consistent and then Lulu 3, and then Annie 3. I think that's the tiering in that order. And that's because I think Seraphine has better matchups in the current meta, because Disco players naturally want to surround that Disco ball, aka Seraphine's going to target and hit a huge amount of AoE to cast Seraphine 3, should wipe that Disco backline. And then you can play Ari as your secondary carry with like Seraphine, have her be a single target damage, play 5 KD, 5 Spellweaver, you know, you, so on and so forth. I do think Lulu 3 is also a really underrated out to play for, especially if you're uh, rolling a lot at level 6 for Seraphine. So if you play Seraphine, try to go for Lulu 3. If you're playing Lulu 3, I actually think that the Hyper Pop version of Lulu is actually very good. And you do want to get to 3 Hyper Pop if you can with Ziggs. This is because the recent buffs to Hyper Pop get 15 mana every single time you cast. That is ridiculous if you really think about it with like all these different units. If you somehow get 4 Hyper Pop, you're probably going to win the game. So yeah, Spellweaver is very versatile. And what might help you pick could also be dependent on like your augments if you have something that like naturally scales really well with you know two to three cost reroll like a march of progress you can consider doing something like this cruel pact going long so on and so forth another thing could be evaluating what's being played in the lobby if you see a lot of disco players you're like man i gotta play for seraphine but if you see you know a lot of annies and people are angling like those melee carries 
you might have Annie and Ari, so you can have like a bunch of single target burst, or maybe see a bunch of three cost reroll, and then you can want to play for Lulu as well. So that's what gives you like the opportunity to play around it very flexibly. Another thing I want to point out is don't forget about your front line. So a lot of times in these situations, if you can hit uh, Nico or Echo 3, which is not very likely, but you might as well try in these scenarios. This is uh, another really powerful thing to play for late game. If you're able to get like, you know, Nico 3, Lulu 3, Seraphine 3, you're probably going to win the game. The other thing I also really like about this comp is that it plays pretty cool with spatulas. You can do KDA or Emo Emblem and you have some flexibility in there. You're probably not going to make True Damage Emblem though. So uh, try to avoid that, even though you do have True Damage units. Some good augments to think about are things like Jewel Lotus that helps you crit with all your AP damage. If you get rolling with like learning the spell, this is mainly for Annie and for Seraphine. If you're able to get like straight up uh, spell weaver augments like Raise the Tempo, that's also a way for you to double cast, kind of like turning to multicast from previous sets. So just anything that does like AP stuff. Also, because as you know, you need like tons of tiers and whatnot. Don't be afraid of taking things like Pandora's. I think that's a good shout out. Katie Ari is still very viable. It's just that she's a little bit weaker than she used to be because they nerfed her attack speed and they also nerfed her best frontline, which was Sentinels. And so it's not like she can't really compete with the best. It's just that she's often not really the best option for the metagame and also uh you really have specific items for her that don't really flex into other things nearly as well because they nerfed other aspects of it so in the past you used to be able to play like blue buff uh onto you know a, a unit and then maybe like think about playing it around uh ezreal and other units that use blue buff but now that blue buff is nerfed it's just a little bit less strong and just enough tweaks make it that ari takes a step down compared to where she used to be the main reason why you're playing ari is because you realize you can't play disco or you just get fed it like you know this early Ari setup and you don't want to be like so inflexible that you're like okay it's like me disco no matter what or like me car this no matter what and like you're just going to ignore the fact that you get like an easy Ari setup just take it it can be a free top four in a lot of scenarios especially if you're able to like you know if you set up something like Ari 2 plus uh, Akali but you do have some flexibility with it like you know instead of this Akali for example you could totally like you know play Ezreal instead and have like big shot with Kaisa you can play 357 on any of the traits like 357 KDA 357 seven spell weaver play around sona every single time you can tech in that lulu maybe you splash in a, a zigs as well for the late game with lulu you have a lot of options on like how you actually want to uh, have a secondary damage source but a lot of times i actually currently prefer to play around reroll spell weavers because it just feels like it gets online quicker and you don't have to nearly gamble as much on your level eight roll down but yeah like it's just a, something that you could think about and the early game has a lot of different ways you can play it actually early mid in general is really dynamic we just wanted to highlight that evelyn did get buffed so she is more reliable now than she was before but you can also just play around like a super fan core plus like an annie i think that also works really well and then and augments that really lean you towards Ari, nothing in particular. Like, you don't really care anything in particular outside of just combat augments. Uh, econ, yeah, it's okay. Like, just take whatever makes sense to help your front line. As with any super fan uh, setup, your front line is going to be uh, your biggest limiting factor. A lot of times, the advantage of super fan is that it's really cheap. But because you're playing around KDA, you're kind of locked into these units. So you oftentimes struggle to have late game durability. But it's a tempo comp. So you end up snatching up a bunch of Aries. You end up having a really efficient board. Board. this is a comp that you can get to nine hit those legendaries and eventually start subbing things out like go down to three kda three spell weaver uh start playing like you know much more reliable five costs and then uh cap with the board for like a top two some people actually are willing to put this in like the top s tier because they think re is reliable enough it's just that uh i personally think that it's like a secondary option to some of the best comps in the game the other thing about this is it actually kind of bridges into another composition that we're talking about which is like super fan ad flex but that's kind of like adjacent to this so i'm willing to kind of separate that and make it to a different uh, section entirely because super fan ad flex around this core around ari is not actually prioritizing ari at all and you're trying to prioritize other carries let's go ahead and talk about that super fan flex uh is a really powerful strategy to play safe for top fours and part of what makes it really good is that there's no real set playbook you basically pick whatever four cost that you can hit on your level eight roll down after slamming generic ad items and tank items and then trying to play around ideally a melee carry on top of a secondary range unit a lot of times people play around ari because she's less contested and honestly ari's become a little bit more flexible in the sense that like if you put her as a secondary carry it doesn't really matter if you have bis on her she'll just generate like a consistent amount of like three to four thousand damage a lot of times people are just like okay like i'll just put like rage blade and then shiv and then like you know just like a random uh like giant slayer like she actually randomly pops off with this kind of stuff but only if you're primarily leaning 
on her as a secondary carry because you have somebody else. An example is if you roll and let's say you hit Ezreal Headliner, then you end up teching in something like a Kaisa instead. And now you have like this KDA big shot. You have three items on Ezreal and they're trying to play around the Ari and then use Super Fan to give Ezreal like plus one item. But this doesn't really kind of go with the core principle of trying to play around the melee carries because it can be really important in this meta where uh, the range carries kind of get jumped on by things like the Akali and the Karthus. So like a lot of times if you hit like Zed, for example, uh, this Zed is fine and you want to try to go for Crowd Diver Zed if possible. If you do hit a Crowd Diver, Kiana is exceptional in this spot. Don't worry that you're playing only three true damage. It's still really good to have this Kiana and you can play like a core like this on eight. You can also obviously play around Akali. Akali is fantastic. Her super fan item is really good with Hodge and then you're able to kind of like itemize uh, her with like red buff and other damage items as well. And there's even ways for you to hybridize things. So, you know, if you're able to play around the super fan and then you play around these units and let's say, you know, you have like AP items, you can eventually replace it with Karthus and find a way back into Pentakill. Another unit that I really want to highlight that people are not playing around is Poppy. I think Poppy is really good and actually really tandemly uh, combines well with Ari if you put them on like the same target. So that way they can kind of like single targetly take a lot of things down one by one and make their way through a bunch of comps. You want to say that if you're playing around Ari, try to see if you can get another spell weaver. So, you know, in this setups that I'm talking about, like always definitely tech in a third spell weaver. It is important to get that damage. The awkward unit is Caitlyn. She doesn't really link very neatly with uh, super fan flex, but you totally can play around her. It's just that she's a little bit awkward because you want rapid fire and you want eight bits uh, and you already have two sentinels. So taking in Garen can be a little bit tricky, but it's still worth doing if you're able to get like, you know, Lucian uh, and then you have to get like uh, Jazz and MF in. It can be kind of nice to still pop off in this way. In this example, you would try to play like MF and Kaisa so that way you can get the KDA and then you would play like a level eight board like this. So super fan flex has like many different ways. In fact, this is probably one of those trees that's going to be developing as the patch continues to evolve because uh, a lot of people are not trying to play AD. So there might be some specialists that try to focus only on developing this AD line and figuring out what's the best optimal combination. So play around with it. But for in general, super fan is like a really strong core way to orient yourself. And I do want to say one thing is that you want to take out of super fan the late game because like this is good enough to stabilize. But once you're done getting this board together, you eventually want to replace this with, you know, the better units, right? Because Super Fan just gives you one item and a little bit of a front line. But in the late stage of the game, you find a way to make it to nine. You still want to like sub all this out for the usual stuff like Alawi and Yorick and a Thresh slash Zack or a set for the, the Mosher as well. So it's like a way you can kind of compartmentalize of like Super Fan helps you get through the early mid game. Mid to late, you play around that four cost Super Fan flex around either those melee and one range unit, ideally. And then you use that to get to the late game to replace that frontline later on. It kind of has a nice like one, two, three to it. If this is all too confusing, don't worry about this comp too much. I'm pretty sure that this comp is like really hard to play. So if you end up going for this, uh, this is basically if you want to really feel good and smart about yourself when you're playing TFT, because uh, this is a really hard tree to play. And it's mainly for people who love to play like open flex, like whatever the game gives me, because I hate being like contested and rolling for like one or two specific headliners. Yasuo reroll is now a lot stronger because they buffed his scaling and now has become quite a powerful champion. Champion, uh, particularly in the late game, if you're able to hit critical mass and get that six true damage online. The good news is that you have top end that can actually scale and even win the game if you're able to snowball and you get true damage emblem. Uh, the bad news is that Kiana is not only difficult to hit, but also Akali is more contested this patch because a lot of people are taking things like Pentakill Akali. But make no mistake, this composition is for real. If you're able to get Yasuo online early with items, it's very, very good. I personally think Yasuo is really good in an item portal because you're able to get things like three item Yasuo very quickly and the faster you can get Yasuo itemized the more likely he's able to scale his ability with um a bunch of AD that you're able to get a lot of people will think like blinked out is actually like the best thing you can start off with because oh you know like this scales Yasuo it gives you a Yasuo like it's a true damage thing but in reality the best augments you can really start off with Yasuo are things like not today so you get that edge of night early or like idealism so you get the Hodge early don't forget that you do want like ultimately a lot of healing though because uh you know healing orbs and harm assist is also really good with all a lot of these melee comps. The tricky thing with Yasuo reroll is that early game, you want to kind of lose streaks so you can build up your economy. But at the same time, you want Yasuo to kill units because every time he's killing units, he's scaling his AD. And so you're like kind of stuck in between like, do I want to kill units? Do I want to win this fight? Prioritize getting those stacks if you can. Getting stacks on Yasuo is really important because the more AD he's stacking, uh, the more likely he's able to get kills in the future. And that also amplifies things like his crit, for example, and almost how much bonus damage you're going to be doing with true damage. And so early 
early game, you're not really going to be leveling up. You're probably going to have like win, win, lose, lose, win, something like that. And that's totally fine. And you might be thinking, hey, well, you know, your economy is going to be kind of borked. You might be thinking like, well, your economy is in a really bad spot, but you should be theoretically only aiming to play Yasuo reroll if you have like a really good Yasuo start. And also another thing to note is that you want true damage Yasuo. You don't want edgelord Yasuo because you want to get to six true damage as soon as you can. And it's a lot harder to do that if you have a plus one edgelord instead. Like a scenario that you might actually find yourself in of when you would want to play Yasuo is if you find a two-star Yasuo early that isn't your headliner because then you're able to kind of find that headliner Yasuo later on and now you have six copies as opposed to trying to find true damage Yasuo early and then trying to rack it up but at the same time if you, if you hit a Yasuo early with like this I mean just go for it as well there's just like a couple different scenarios that you would want to try to angle for it it is really powerful um but it is like surprisingly more contested than you think because of Akali and also even like Viego and Mord like these can be difficult units to try to get because of the other edgelord rerolls like Yone and Riven. Uh, try not to play this comp. If you see a lot of Yone, Riven, and Pentakill in the lobby, it's going to be very difficult. Instead, just try to focus on something else, like maybe try to either contest those rerolls or play a different comp entirely. Uh, but yeah, this is uh, really good. And also, it ends up being a comp that, uh, surprisingly, if you live long enough, you can actually get to 9 true damage because usually uh, the 9 true damage requires you to have a Yasuo and a true damage headliner, aka you could probably play it off this comp. So uh, sometimes if you look for those like Hall the Nine and Spatial Star portals, uh, Yasuo ends up being being like a pretty good option to get to those nine true damage crazy board states. IVDM got nerfed at the top end, but it's still good if you're able to get everything online. It's just not really broken as the way it was before. Previously on the holiday patch, uh, I would probably say Jax was S tier and like the best two cast rule by far. Now he's like solid and can like firmly land in top fours with potential of like maybe winning if you're like high rolling everything, but probably not. There's a couple of updates to the Jax comp that are worth noting. Uh, one is Lux 3 absolutely is a win condition on top of Jax 3. I mean, that sounds fairly obvious. Like, oh, I'm rolling for another three-star unit. That has to be good. Uh, it is. But specifically, it's really good with the choice of sampling Lux or Jax. I'm going to open up the team builder and show you exactly what I'm talking about. A lot of times you play this Lux in the third row because you want her to be able to snipe the back line. When she has Jax's ability that's sampled, meaning you take the triangle and you put it onto that Jax and not the Lux, Lux keeps the range of her auto attack, which is four, and then she gets becomes Jax's ability, so it becomes plus one. So she actually has the ability to reach back line from the third row. If you don't understand what I mean, just put Lux in the third row and just watch. If there's a higher target that is all the way in the back, like a carry and all the front line is softened up so jump to the back and do the jacks whip and then actually sometimes even snipe the carry in the back line that's one thing that we discovered that's really good just having like lux 3 as a reliable secondary the other thing is you now have the option of sampling lux in certain matchups if you're going up against disco for example disco tends to be all in like one corner right you have like the disco nami Tarek, uh ragus all huddling up like they're in some kind of football huddle the thing that you can do in particular is choose to sample the Lux as you're loading into the fight. If you know that you're going up against a composition that Jax sample is better like where you know you want to take down a bunch of melee carries then you go for jacks but if you're going up against like a range carry like twisted fate disco you can sample lux at the beginning of your fight after you load it and see where your opponent is it sounds really cheesy because it is basically you get to be the one that chooses which is the best sample unit for that specific fight as long as you position correctly it's actually quite obnoxious and a lot of high elo players are complaining about it because they feel like it's just so ridiculous that you get to select like the absolute best sample choice uh, before the fight starts. So I do think that as players catch on to this, they're going to try to play Jax more often. That being said, uh, Jax and Lux is pretty expensive and rare to hit two, both of them as three stars. If you do end up sampling Lux at a two star, it's significantly weaker than the three star version. So it is something to think about only when you're trying to play for the top end. Otherwise, I probably would sample Jax every time. The other thing to note is that the Jazz variation is nice because the extra HP and bonus damage goes a long way and uh, you can actually play a two healthy variation of this board where you actually drop a Yone and you play Katarina and you drop a set and said you play like Nar and then you can go for like uh like a like a Gragas for a two-star bruiser so you actually have a lot of options to play around two healthy to also get like those stats itemization hasn't really changed either you really want to go for like Jewel Gauntlet and Hand of Justice Edge of Night has actually started falling a little bit out of favor because there's 
there's less like single target burst as much as uh before because people had Ari and Ari would lock onto the Jax and Jax would like die because Ari would just keep shooting it over and over. But now that people are playing a lot of like, you know, cards to Kali, which is like AoE and like, you know, rat rag tag team, like and more like run and gun, tag the Jax and like chip him down. You can actually play him as triple damage or Titans again. Triple damage item in here would probably be a Giant Slayer. I still think the best item for Jax uh bar none is Zonia's. If you find a Zonia it is insane on this unit. You definitely should be playing Zonia's on Jax alongside uh, the Jewel Gauntlet and the Hodge. The core game plan for Jax also changed a little bit. Before in the past, you used to like open fort and then roll down on six and try to see if you can like get all the Jaxes and stuff like that and then stay on six and try to get Jax three, eventually get to seven and look for the EDM. But the optimization is now you want to econ up and stabilize on six enough, then go to seven with as much gold as possible. And stable on six is kind of where the comp is at its most difficulty and how to tell if you're stable on six is the hardest part about the comp usually if you hit like you know a uh, mosher jacks then that's probably good enough and you don't have to necessarily roll for the edm version of jacks just play that with like a super fan core in fact if you play something kind of like this even like play around like moshers it's also fine you can even have like a situation where you're playing around like an entirely different set of units not necessarily even these and put like the items onto like a katarina and stabilize on crowd divers for example or you put like jg hodge on a headliner bard right and that bard is carrying you to seven just find a way to get to seven and be as healthy as possible with as much as gold and then you want to start rolling on seven with uh with with your gold when i say rolling on seven i mean slow rolling above 50 by the way uh this is because uh edm has four costs that you need to hit on seven and you're just not going to hit it on six and so that's why the optimization of the comp is now trying to prioritize hitting jack three and lux three on seven and the odds aren't that bad for two costs misfortune jazz reroll is back although i think it's interesting because it's kind of hard to pull off if you don't have something like that's jazz baby it's like augment dependent to try to really enable the power of scaling that jazz stats kind of similar to the very beginning of the set not to mention that jazz emblem is not a thing anymore so crafting the jazz emblem is really difficult but if you do end up getting everything and you get the lucian as well the peak of this comp is very high it can definitely win lobbies very very strong you really get everything online there is an interesting twist that people are doing now people are now starting to realize that kaisa 3 with the buff can also be really good in this kind of setup as well and so what you can actually do is go for mf as a prio and instead of trying to go for bard as a secondary roll for kaisa three and give her leftover ad items a spot that you might be thinking about doing this is if you open up like ad items let's say you have like you know bow glove sword and you're like oh i could try to see if i can angle like riven yone but then you see that like it's really contested and other people have like really good spots for it like they start off like ribbon pair and they have, like team building like things like that and you're like oh, i don't want to contest that what do i do i have 80 items i don't play 80 flex think about mf with uh kaisa it ends up being pretty good uh if you end up like prioritizing these things and hit on time you really need a ton of economy though because the other thing that you really care about is three starring your front line not necessarily uh the Kennen and lilia because they're one cost and chances are you're not gonna be able to hit one costs while rolling for mf at seven you're probably gonna aim for like nico three or echo three as super fan becomes more and more popular though this is gonna be hard to pull off so i also care about frontline augments a lot if you're able to take like a stationary support that gives you a zero route for example that's really really nice gives you that Saul. Anything that can also heal that front line, like healing orbs, can be pretty nice too. Core game plan is pretty much the same from the beginning of the set. You want to play around super fan plus AD. So a lot of times you end up going for, say, like a Corky as an item holder. And that kind of allows you to level six. Don't overall on level six. You need to get to seven to ultimately play for uh the synergies. This is a level seven reroll comp that doesn't care about four costs. It's just more that at level seven, you get everything. You get the super fan, you get the big shot, you get the jazz, and the synergies look really nice. Don't ignore frontline items. You might be thinking about like oh you know misfortune and then you try to prioritize like you know kaisa three because florian said itemize kaisa three make sure you get the front line it's very very important you do so if you don't have last whisper you can just go for even shroud but your front line is more fragile so it's harder to hold on to it that's why a lot of people prefer things like last whisper um and so she can shred for herself uh overall though like solid comp i put it uh in like kind of the middle slash bottom of a tier we put it as b that probably needs to be updated yeah i actually anticipate this comp to gain more popularity but as super fan becomes more contested this becomes harder to pull off just needs too much gold i think 
Olaf Evil has been largely a meme all set, but now he is for real. I personally think that Olaf Evil is really good under two conditions. One condition is having a bruiser based augment like too big to fail, which I think is, you know, pretty solid and generic because your bruisers uh, deal extra damage. My favorite setup is Gargantuan Resolve because he scales really nicely by having all of these stacks that scale both his AD and AP, and he can utilize that for a lot of sustain. Olaf is particularly really good if you're able to get an off early. So I do think it's one of those comps you want to kind of hyper roll to get online, but you really shouldn't be looking to play Olaf unless you get specifically the Bruiser Olaf and the correct setup and a lot of Olafs in general. Because if you get Olaf Headliner and you're not getting a lot of copies of Olaf and you have things like Gargantuan Resolve, you probably might as well just play like a Yone comp, for example, uh, that's just a lot more reliable. If you do in a game Gargantuan Resolve, two Titans is very much worth it. Like Titans, Titans, like BT or Sterix, uh, Hodge, whatever you want. Slam whatever you can get on him. And getting six Bruiser is very legit. Plus, uh, Karth is Akali and you can kind of play for uh, whatever makes sense in the metagame in this case we position things like the uh 10 seconds in the back corners because we're trying to have backline corner bait for other akalis but feel free to move it around it's just that melee carry space gets really tight and once you hit a lowey it becomes a little bit of a puzzle you actually end up dominating early game a lot this actually reminds me of chogath reroll in the sense that um if you guys remember Cho'Gath from set nine, you actually end up like wind streaking a lot because uh, the early game Bruiser HP was like too much to overcome. And Cho'Gath also wanted to kill units with his feast to get stacks. In the same way, you end up actually winning a lot of fights with an Olaf headliner. In fact, just as a throw out there, I'm pretty sure Olaf headliner is like one of the best one cost headliners in the game, if not the best right now. And so uh, you just end up having a lot of tempo on your side. And so it's not going to be actually uncommon for you to five streak if you end up hitting like a peak Olaf spot where you get four Bruiser early and you get a bunch of Olaf items. Eventually you level to add pentakill it's not a big priority because remember pentakill is weak early and yeah i mean it's pretty straightforward comp very fun i do think it's a position very thoughtfully because uh you want to have olaf away from like really high burst targets like you don't want him to kind of get blown up early by uh, a bunch of high burst things like a ribbon for example you want him to be inheriting the pentakill bonus by having things die so you can scale him in the fight so just make sure that olaf is safe and position very thoughtfully and as i said before you don't like make sure you get into weird traffic jam where he can't uh, walk in anything or a collie gets trapped, so on and so forth. They can get kind of messy. I would probably say that this is starting to kind of go towards the bottom of the A tier because of how obscure uh, it is. You're not supposed to actually play Olaf Rehul that often, but when you do get this spot, uh, it is actually a sight to behold. It's very, very beastly. True damage flex is labeled as A, but I think it's borderline between A and B tier at the moment, largely because Akali is very contested and you don't really want to play this without the true damage emblem. If you do have the true damage emblem, its ceiling is still really high. It's just that it's kind of hard to get a consistent amount of frontline. And also, as Superfan continues to improve in popularity, it's just going to be harder and harder to hit. And you still need Kiana. It just has too many conditions to get online, um, but it's still solid. And true damage is good enough that you can definitely sneak in some top fours in terms of like rerolling senna rerolling senna is less reliable because i just don't think that the meta favors her right now not to mention that a lot of times when you're high rolling like super fan senna a lot of times you just kind of want to tech into like disco because you know this ends up being really nice uh in terms of like chaining to a twist of fate so it's just like kind of awkward and if you're not playing disco you end up playing like this kind of core to like a spell weaver so it's just a little bit uh uncommon to play for it but the peak of the comp is still really really good if you're able to get that true damage emblem true damage emblem can be played on ezreal on caitlin on ari you could probably play true damage emblem even on karthus these days although you still want to probably get pentakill so that's going to be difficult to do if you're playing uh in this kind of core but uh, i do want to mention it because it is something that you could play for and again you're trying to look on this for portals that give you like early spatulas or like an early emblem of some sort um or you're just like slamming generic items uh and then you end up getting a spatula with like a sword and like hey i can make a true damage emblem i get uh blinked out that kind of stuff could be pretty good and nine true damage is still really good as we mentioned in the yasuo portion uh nine true damage is really good still definitely a win condition if you play this you're able to high roll and the good news is people aren't picking true damage emblem nearly as much you're not going to be contested and if they appear anywhere near as frequently as they did last patch magically every single late game carousel you're probably gonna hit nine true damage every single game as long as you survive
Now we're kind of entering the B tier of things where it starts to get really murky. I'm not entirely sure how viable some of these comps are, but I have seen them pop off or I've heard that they do really well and look at some of the stats. The first one we're going to talk about is Kale reroll. Kale is really interesting because she has a lot of potential, but one, she's a contested unit because a lot of people are playing like Pentakill plus Edgelord, so it's kind of hard for her to three star. Kind of similar to the Senna effect from previous patches where could you reliably hit Senna three when everyone was playing Senna on their boards? And two, I don't think people really understand her itemization myself included a lot of times on paper people think that she's an attack speed carry because if you look at her damage it is scaling with the amount of times you auto attacks but at the same time uh it feels like she doesn't deal enough in the late game unless you put raw ap on her like archangels death cap giant slayer that kind of stuff and at the same time you also kind of want her to heal a little bit so like gunblade's like really good on her as well if you perform it almost feels like she kind of wants like five items and like a really good augment like metalheads for a pencil kill or if you go edgelords you want to go for live for danger i'm pretty sure seven edgelords kale is peak power uh but it's really hard to get and also there's like this big question mark of what you play in the mid game if you're playing like five edge lord three pentakill but i do think that kale at her peak is very very powerful it's just that this is not super reliable so proceed with caution uh i do think that nar three is also something you can also roll for as well since you're rolling at six a lot for like all these units but um the results have been kind of a mixed bag diego is your secondary carry so yeah just pretty much try this out if you're willing to throw it some LP. I've heard it's good. Uh, I'm pretty sure Metalheads is the main condition for Kale, but hey, maybe you end up having a live for danger. Maybe you're in a spot where you try to play for Twisted Fate and you get thrown infinite Kales and you have this Rage Blade. Just try it. I don't know. A lot of people say Rage Blade is not the best in slot item, but uh, hey, maybe you figure it out before we all do. It's still a work in progress. Punk is in an interesting spot right now because there's a couple different ways you can play it. A lot of times people are actually thinking about Jinx and I laid out the usual thing that you can play with Jinx with like, you know, Last Whisper of Runins and Attack Speed or AD. Like sometimes you want to play like a, like a Rage Blade or something else that makes sense for her. But a lot of people are trying out Vi in particular because Vi got a lot of buffs and she's also a good item holder early. So you could actually have her like, you know, pick up as an item holder and then you get a lot of copies of Jinx and like, okay, maybe I end up playing like a Punk spot. But the other thing that I think that's also really good about punk in particular is that there are more spatula portals now than before you might get something like a spatula start or you might get you know loot subscription aka hold a nine and you get like an early tome or an early spatula and you're like hey you know i could actually try to think about a punk spot if i'm here i think six punk is still really good uh you even can try to play other different variations where you play around six punk and twitch as your primary carry and you're not playing twin terror i've actually had success with that it's almost like you're playing like twin terror but just with punk uh units instead of a duplicate of all the executioners so punk is more versatile than it was before i personally don't know about this extended play augments they did buff it but apparently there's been bugs with it in the past where you sometimes don't get a component for uh you know three starring a punk champion so I'll proceed with caution i will say one thing about this punk composition is that it caps really high if you're able to get a punk emblem on poppy or yorick very very solid because they scale very nicely with the hp and the ad and if you do end up getting like a four guardian setup it's really good but you can probably get away with two by cutting both of these and and playing like other high quality units like in Alawi and maybe going for some other scaling in the late game. Like you can find like Lucian, for example, instead of Aphelios. Lucian with Punk sounds good. Wait, Lucian with Punk sounds really good. What the heck? I just thought of that for the first time. That just goes to show you like how underexplored this this line is. Most top players and challenger players avoid this like the play because I guess because they don't really like re-rolling with low cap. The problem with Punk in general is that you're always playing for like a fourth by default. It doesn't feel like you ever are strong enough to really deal with like these crazy Real comps like Riven Yone, and you don't hold up well against like legendary boards and all these like caps like disco stuff. So, yeah, not to mention that it actually has kind of a bad matchup against Akali and Karthus. So, I think, uh, you know, Punk can be something you play, but again, I put it in this B tier because it can be strong. Um, and I think it's really intuitive. That's really nice. I actually recommend Punk for beginner players in general because it's like an easy comp for you to learn and it can be a really nice way to net top fours while having a general, uh, good sense of like what to do you're rolling for like the same core units but if you're like a you know diamond plus player and you're looking for like when do i play punk it's usually if you have an opportunity to get a spat uh i'm trying i'm not really trying to play punk otherwise i'd rather play the twin terror uh versions of uh reroll the last of the B tier comps is kind of a spicy one. It's Super Fan Mega Nar. This is a comp that, honestly, I'm still not entirely sure if I believe in it, but I have seen it do a huge amount of work before. And it's largely about whether or not you can hit 
five super fan nar and nothing less you really need that steric gauge to be a radiant version and then you have nar kind of go crazy with the pentakill with support from karthus and akali because they're better at this patch you're going to be ultimately playing a karthus akali comp but you're just also asking for nar you're telling me i have to hit these two units which are super contested and you go to nar three it just feels really impractical overall but if you can get it and you get something even crazier like do it for the fans i mean maybe i'm skeptical but uh, i mean it doesn't stop chat from asking for it every single time they see a nar pair or a headliner nar i mean i think people just lose their mind when they see like a nar pair or a headliner nar and you have a single bow so you uh so overall you can give it a try some into the pit is probably really good as well because they recently uh changed that to be more intuitive and they have changed the nar headliner to be uh less uh inti what i mean by that is he used to like instantly transform and like go to the back and get targeted but uh now he should actually have a slight delay so there's a little bit more consistency to that in general i think this is one of those like if you have have a lot of copies of gnar like go for it but you're not really looking to do it like a lot of times you might have like gnar hold items for like a yone for example and then you end up hitting like a lot more nars you're like okay this could be a replacement gnar and then all of a sudden you say like wait this could be a gnar 3 game that's probably a scenario where it can make sense if you have super fan gnar but it has to be so rare and that's why it's got to be in that b tier you're really not supposed to play this I will say Metalheads is also good for this comp too because uh, you're able to get that CC uh, for NAR or rather that anti-CC. Yeah, have fun. Uh, I'm glad we included this, but... Uh... <laughs> So there you have it. All the comps in the A and B tier that I think can compete with the S tier is just a lot more conditional to set up. But if you hit those peak power levels, you are good to go. Let me know if I miss anything or you have any specific text that you have for the patch in the comments below and I'll respond. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you guys next time.